He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. The worst part about feeling broken is that you feel like you can never be repaired. You feel like um, you may not ever be good enough for God. And, and that's, that's how I felt at times, where um, I would continually make decisions that would lead to brokenness. Uh, I felt separated from God. I felt like there was, uh, there was no connection between Him and I. And that's a, that's a horrible feeling. Jesus intervened in a way in, in a way that only he can. Things are different in the way that I make decisions, in the way that I interact with my family, the people around me, uh, because I now turn to Jesus when before I used to turn to other things. He is who I model my life after, who I, I wanna be like with my kids, who I wanna be like with my wife with the people that I meet. He is the source now in everything that I do. I've seen him show up in my life and repair that brokenness. And when I return to him, things are better. Can broken hearts be restored? Can fractured relationships be put back together? Can rebels come home again and know their arms are open, the door is not locked, it hasn't, the, the, the key hasn't been changed? Do we worship a God who's ready to forgive and restore and help us begin again. I've been thinking a lot about this, preparing for this message and walking in this series that we're in right now on these post-resurrection appearances. I mean, when you think about it, it's staggering that Jesus, God Almighty who left heaven, came among us, born in a manger, lived a life with no sin, no wrong, yet they nailed him to a cross. And on that cross, he took our sins, he took our shame, he took our punishment, and, and he died to make us whole. And then, after they put him in the grave and he was there for three days, he rose again. And after Jesus rose from the dead, he showed up. He just started popping up on a road with a couple of guys going to the town of Emmaus, with a couple of women who were weeping and struggling because they'd lost the one they love most in this world, Jesus. And he showed up to them, the resurrected Lord. He showed up two different times to the disciples in locked rooms, in, in fear, hiding, and he's there. Peace, peace, he says to them. And today, we hear a story of restoration, of redemption, of God reclaiming someone who thought they had gone too far and sinned too much and rebelled too much against Jesus. As I've thought about this, what struck me is a very simple truth, that every single person gathered today, whether you're online, whether you're on campus, that every single person, if we who've come to the cross and received the grace of Jesus, if we believe the lies of the enemy, that when we stumble, and we all do, when we mess up, and every Christian does at some point along the way, and when we mess up big time, the enemy loves to sneak alongside of us and say, now you blew it. Jesus doesn't love you anymore. You've gone too far this time. There is no restoration for you. There is no redemption for you. Work as hard as you want. God's arms are never gonna open to you again. The enemy loves to whisper lies. But they're exactly that. They're lies from the pit of hell. And then when we believe them, we keep God at arm's length, and we forget that he is in the business of restoring. He loves to redeem. He loves to heal. Not just when we first put our faith in him, but every time we stumble. 
And some of you today are believing the lies of the enemy. Some of you are, are online watching, but you're keeping a distance because you're, you're thinking, you don't know what I did. You don't know how I turned away from him. You don't know how I acted, how I thought, how I behaved, how I treated that person. If you did know, you'd know why God doesn't want to forgive me. I need to tell you, that's not true. And in today's resurrection encounter, we're going to learn that. So Jesus, this is our prayer. Wherever we are spiritually, that we would hear a message of restoration, a message of redemption, a message of healing. We pray today that you would silence the lies of the enemy and reveal them for what they are, lies from the pit of hell. And oh God, will you speak truth to our hearts this day? Will you reveal the truth of your word? Will you reveal the person and the character of Jesus? And will you give us the honesty to acknowledge that when we stumble and fall, we recognize that we need reminders of your grace, that you are a God who heals. Speak to every person listening today, and I pray for those who don't yet know you, Jesus. They'll hear a message of such profound grace that they will be drawn to the heart of the only one who can truly cleanse us and heal us and forgive us, and the one who wants to do it even more than we want to have it done. Speak your truth to us this day, Jesus. We pray this in your name and for your glory. Well, I want to invite you to open your eyes and see the risen Jesus, to see this picture of Jesus when he rose. He is in the business of restoration and new beginnings. Jesus loves new beginnings. Jesus, Jesus is watching and waiting. The God that we worship wants to take our, far, our sins as far as the east is from the west. And each time we stumble, he's ready to extend grace. Now, he doesn't just say, oh, go do whatever you want because I'm going to give you grace. We seek to follow him. We seek to live for him. We seek to turn from sin and repent of sin. But when we stumble, 1 John tells us if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, listen to this, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you've confessed your sins to Jesus, if you've come to the cross, and if even since then you stumble and fall and you confess those sins, he's ready to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's the heart of Jesus. That's the desire of Jesus. And that's the message we need to hear today. I don't know how many of you are golfers. If you're a golfer or even a casual golfer, there's a term that's found its way into the world of golf. It's not an official term. It's never a term you'll hear in a golf tournament because this is not allowed in a golf tournament. But this is a term that's used with kind of casual golfers. Imagine a group of people meeting to golf and, and one person's running late. They, you know, the, the tea time is at eight in the morning and, and they're, they're turning into the, into the parking lot of the golf course at like, at like 7.58 and they haven't stretched and they haven't gotten ready to golf and they get out of the car and they grab their clubs out of the trunk and they run to the first tee and the whole group is, oh, you made it. But they are not psychologically ready for golf. They are not physically ready for golf, but they're there. So they tee up and take a lash at the ball, and it does this. Here's the fairway, and it goes pew over there, or whoosh over there, out of bounds, in a pond, in some shrubs, whatever it is. Well, there's a, a word that some golfers will use. They'll say, hey, take a... Some of you know it. <laughs> take a mo Some of you go, how'd they know that? You're not a golfer. You don't know. Every world has its own little language, right? And if you're part of that world, you know the language. Have a mulligan. A mulligan is a free do-over. That shot was so bad, so ugly, so hideous. <laughs> and we all recognize it, so just start over. Tee up another ball, try again. Now, that doesn't happen in tournaments, but among friends, it does happen. And with God. Our God is a God of second chances. Our world may not let us take a second chance. A person may not forgive us. But Jesus came to bring restoration and healing between us and the Father. He's in the business of do-overs, of new beginnings. And if today you're feeling very distant from God, you say, I've come to the cross, I've received Jesus, but I've messed up and I've blown it. I've made some dumb choices, bad, some, some inappropriate actions, some thoughts that I wish I could cleanse out of my mind, but there they are. God says, I am a God who's ready to restore. And, and so Peter's life and Peter's story bring this alive. We talk here about the text that we believe. We believe that the text of this book, of the scriptures, is true from beginning to end. 
And so I want to tell you the story of Peter. But I want to tell you in three scenes, three different scenes. If you have your Bibles, you can follow along. The first one's in Luke. The second one's in Matthew. The third one's in John. In, in, the, in the Bible, the first two-thirds of the Bible is called the Old Testament. It's all that happened before Jesus came. And the last third of the Bible is called the New Testament. And, and that's from when Jesus came. And Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, those four books that start the New Testament are all four different people telling the story of Jesus from their unique perspective. All of it true, but unique vantage points that when you see all their vantage points, you get the whole story, the whole picture. It's like having four different witnesses point to what happened, and each one has a different angle, and through all their stories, you get the full picture. Well, we're going to look at the story of Peter and his journey with Jesus and ask God to speak to our hearts about this, this truth of restoration. So here's scene one. Jesus invites Peter to follow him. We're in Luke chapter five, Luke chapter five, beginning in verse one. And I want you just to listen. You, you won't see the, if you have your Bibles, you can follow along in your Bibles, Luke 5, 1. Uh, but if you don't have your Bible, just listen to the story. It won't be on the, usually we have the Bible passage on the screen, but I want you just to hear this as a story, all right? So one day Jesus was standing by the Sea of Galilee. There's different names that are used, but it's the Sea of Galilee, this great fishing place. The people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge, so, so Jesus is there, he's preaching, he's teaching. People are coming in, there's a lot of people. He sees along the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. Now, if you understand how fishermen worked in that time, they would use nets to catch fish. At the end of a long, long night, they're done. They've caught nothing. They're cleaning their nets. They're, they're checked out for the day. You ever worked a 10, 12-hour shift, been exhausted, you're just finishing the cleanup, you're just finishing, you're done, and someone says, hey, you want to go back to work? Well, this is what happens. He saw these boats at the water's edge. They're washing their nets, all right? He got into one of the boats, to the one belonging, belonging to Simon. Simon is, is Peter. He's renamed Peter later. And Jesus asked him to put out a little from the shore. You know, can I borrow your boat? Can I use it as a preaching platform? The people are crowding against me. I'm up against the water. If I go back a little bit in the water, sound carries great across that, a little, little outdoor amphitheater. And so, so he says, you know, can you put out a little bit from the, to, from the shore? There Jesus sat down and taught the people from the boat. So here Jesus is teaching, all right? When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Now you continue on and send Simon response. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. Zip, zero, null, nothing. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. Once he drops those nets back in the water, what does he have to do when he's done? Clean them again. So he says, Master, I'll, I've been fishing all night. We're exhausted. We've already cleaned the nets. But because you asked me to, I'm going to do it. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. That's a lot of fish. And after fishing all night long and getting nothing, that's like, wow, incredible, miraculous stuff. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. He had a sense of who Jesus was. This isn't just, isn't just a rabbi. It's just a teacher. He's getting a sense of who Jesus is. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's fishing partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. Simon's best day of fishing became the last day he fished for a long time for fish. Because Jesus said, you've got a new assignment. You're going to follow me. In one of the Gospels, Jesus says right here, follow me. It's a rabbi's call for him to become a disciple. Now, you have to understand in the ancient world, in the ancient, ancient Jewish world at that time, when a rabbi called someone to follow them, the rabbis would call educated students, the brightest minds, the most gifted young people that can be raised up. They didn't call fishermen. But Jesus says to Simon Peter, you're done fishing for fish. You're going to follow me. You're going to fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on the shore. And they, they, Peter, James, John, this group, they pulled their boats up on the shore, left everything, and they followed Jesus. It's an amazing story. It's the call of Peter. Peter, 
follow me. Leave the life you're in, begin a new life of being my disciple, being my follower, learning from me. And so for the next three years, Peter did what the ancient people would call he walked in the dust of the rabbi. He walked behind Jesus and he watched what Jesus did. He listened to what Jesus said. He observed how Jesus treated people. He learned through formal didactic teaching. He learned through life experience. He was mentored, discipled, trained by Jesus for three years. And and in that time, Peter, with this incredible boldness, Peter, who who Jesus nicknamed Rocky. So I'm going to call you Petros, the rock. I added that part. But, But his nickname is the rock. You're the... And in that time, whenever when a moment would come up, Peter was the one who'd jump up to defend Jesus, jump up to respond. He was this passionate, committed guy, and he followed Jesus. As a matter of fact, when Jesus said to his disciples, there's gonna come a moment when you're gonna all turn and run away from me. There's gonna come a moment when I'm so persecuted, when people are coming after me to attack me, that you're all gonna run. Peter's response is, maybe those guys, but not me. It's in the Bible. They may all run from you, but Jesus, when the heat is on, you'll look next to yourself and I'll be standing there. That's Peter's confidence. I will, I will die before I deny you. Scene number two. If you have your Bibles, turn to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 26. In Matthew chapter 26, Jesus has been arrested. Three years of ministry, Last Supper with his disciples. Judas leads a crowd into the garden. They arrest Jesus. They take Jesus to these courtyards and they begin this process of bringing false witnesses, liars who tell lies about him. And they bring this false narrative and they take the things he said and they twist those things. And in the midst of all of this, Peter follows kind of hanging back in the shadows and watching to see what's going to happen to Jesus. Remember, he's been following Jesus for three years. And and so now, he's there in the courtyard where they're going through these trials, and and he's watching and observing. And we're going to pick this up in Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter, uh, chapter 26, beginning in verse 69. Now, Peter was sitting in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him, you also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said. Now, it's a time of pressure. The, the, the temperature's gone up right now. And she sees him and she says, you were with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. I don't know the guy. One person, one servant girl, kind of points a finger Don't know Jesus. This is rocky. This is the rock on which Jesus wants to build his church. This is the one who said, they may all deny you, but I won't. One servant girl. You were with him. Don't know the guy. Verse 71. Then he went out to the gateway where another servant girl saw him and said to the people there, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. She says of Simon Peter. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. Now now Peter ramps it up with an oath. I swear. I swear. I don't know the man. This is Peter. This is the rock. This is the one on whom Jesus wants to build the church. As his first leader in the church. I swear. I don't know Jesus. Now, side note. While this is all going on in this courtyard, at the edge of the courtyard, Jesus is there. And Jesus can see and hear everything that's going on. This isn't happening in secret. This is happening in front of Jesus. And so the second denial. After a little while, verse 73, after a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you're one of them, one of those disciples of Jesus. Your accent gives you away. We can hear it in your voice. We can hear your accent. You're you're one of them. 
Then he began to curl, then, then Peter began to call down curses, plural, and swore to them, I don't know the man. At this point, Peter ramps up again. I don't know the man. I swear I don't know Jesus. If I know Jesus, may I be cursed? May I be cursed? May I be cursed? He calls down curses on himself. He swears he doesn't know him. Another one of the Gospels says at this moment, Jesus looked straight at Peter. Their eyes met. And Peter realized what he had done. What he said he would never do. What he swore he would never do. Jesus, when the time comes and the storms come pounding against you, I'll be there. I'll have your back. I'll be with you. I'm your follower. I'm Peter. And he denies and denies and swears and curses. May I be cursed if I know Jesus. I don't know the man. Jesus connects eye to eye with him. And then, immediately the rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will all disown me. You will disown me three times, but you specifically. All of you will deny me, but Peter, you will disown you. Then he said, no, I won't. Then he went out, and this is probably one of the most um, understated passages in the Bible. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Wept bitterly. He was broken. He was devastated. And we know what happens next. After these false trials, after all the lies, after all of the... After all the false witnesses tell their lies, Jesus is nailed to a cross with two common criminals. He dies on that cross. The soldier thrusts the spear into his side. The blood and the water come out. They put him in the grave. They put him in a tomb, and he's dead. That's scene two. Scene one, a joyous moment. Jesus calls Peter. Scene two, Peter at his lowest moment, and he denies and denies and denies Jesus. But then scene three. Scene three is found in John chapter 21. And in John chapter 21, uh, we, we see this uh, amazing picture of restoration. So look with me at John chapter 21 if you have your Bibles or, or simply listen to the story. So now Jesus has died on the cross and Jesus is showing up. He's appearing to people. So Peter's seen Jesus, but he has this sense that even though he's seen Jesus, even though Jesus is risen, he's still going back to fishing for fish because the whole fishing for people was Jesus' call in his life. And my sense is that Peter feels like I'm not qualified anymore. When Jesus was here, I followed him, I blew it, I messed up, so I'm going to go back to my previous life. So he goes out fishing uh, with the disciples. In, in John 21, 3, I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. Now, do you remember what happened the night before Jesus called Peter the first time? What was he doing all night long? Fishing. What did he catch? Familiar story, Right? Okay, he caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not recognize that it was Jesus. He was too far away across the lake. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? What does every fisherman or fisherwoman not want to hear when they've been out for hours or a whole night and fished all night? What do they not want to hear? Got any fish? Catch anything? Right? No, they answered. Jesus said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Sound familiar? Do you think Jesus is trying to take Peter back to his call to help help him remember? Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's the disciple John, said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say it is the Lord and he recognizes, he wrapped his outer garment around himself. He they were, were very little when they were fishing because it was physical labor. But he puts his outer garment on and he jumps into the water. He starts swimming for shore. That was Peter. Just respond. Figure it out later. He jumps in the water, starts swimming. All right. The other disciples followed in the boat, uh, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about 100 yards out. When they landed, they saw a fire burning uh, a, a fire of burning coals with fish on it and some bread. I love this. 
the resurrected Jesus had prepared breakfast for them. It's a beautiful picture. Because Jesus, who was the servant of servants, kept serving even after his resurrection. You know, the Bible actually says that one of the things Jesus is doing right now for you is interceding for you. He still serves us. It's staggering. It's amazing. It's beautiful. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you've just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back in the boat and dragged the net ashore. And I love this. You know that these are fishermen because it says this. It was full of large fish, 153 exactly. You know, these are fishermen. Why? Their fish were big, every one of them, and they counted every one of them, right? And it's right there in the Bible. It's so cool. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. They sit together around this fire, and they share breakfast together. Now, after breakfast, after they've shared the meal, Jesus doesn't bring up anything with Peter before that personally. You might picture this story that continues as Peter and Jesus alone having a conversation, but that's not what's happening. The whole group is there around the fire. They get to watch and hear and see what happens next, and so do you. So do you. And so, when they'd finished eating, this is verse 15 of John 21, when they finished eating, when their fish and bread was done, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more? Uh, scholars have debated and discussed when he said, do you love me more than these? What is that? Do you love me more than these 150 fish? 153 fish? Maybe. Do you love me more than these other disciples? Do you still love me the most? Because you said that once. Didn't go real well, right? Is, he, is, is that what he's saying? He said, do, do you love me more than you love the other disciples? Do you love me more than the other disciples love me? What, I, I don't know exactly what Jesus is asking. I think Peter in his heart knew, and that's good enough for me. But Jesus says to him, Peter, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. What does that mean? Jesus says to Peter, I called you three years ago to follow me, to do my work. Get back to work. Serve me again. But Jesus, I'm not worthy. You saw me. You heard me. I denied you. I've compromised myself. And Jesus says to him, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Jesus answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. How many times did Jesus uh, hear Peter deny him? How many times? Three. He's walking Peter back to his heart. He's walking Peter back to wholeness. He's walking Peter back to his call and to a life of serving him. So he's asked him twice. Now, as we can do a whole study about the language and the words for love, we're not going to have time to get into that today. But I want you to hear one more time. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. And then verse 17, the third time, Jesus said to him, Peter, Simon Peter, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Peter, I know how you feel. I know what you're going through. I know how you see yourself. But I'm telling you, I still love you. You still love me. Yes, you blew it. Yes, you messed up. You denied me, and you denied me, and you denied me. But now you get to say, I love you, I love you, I love you. And every time Jesus says, so serve me, live for me, serve me. It's beautiful. And then, um, if you look down at verse 19, the end of verse 19 says this, then he said to him, Jesus said to Peter, these two words, he said, follow me, follow me, live for me. I don't know the details of your life. I know my own life. And I know that if every time I messed up, I stopped serving Jesus, I'd never preach again. You're a pastor. You got it all together. Now I'm learning to follow Jesus. And every time I fall, he takes his hand and says, stand back up. Kevin, do you love me? You know I do. Then serve me. 
but God, I'm broken. I'm imperfect. I mess up. And he says, that's why I came to die for you. That's why I came. And as I was preparing this message, um, I really felt there's a lot of people that are part of Shoreline, whether you're alone at home or at home with families or in the courtyard of the family worship and you're here in the worship center. There's a lot of people part of Shoreline who are feeling like, Jesus, I messed up. I blew it. I'm the one who said, I'll be there for you, Jesus. And when the, when the heat was on, I ran. I may not have denied you by saying, I don't know Jesus, but my actions sure looked like I didn't know you. My actions sure looked like I wasn't following you. My thoughts went places they shouldn't have gone. My words, man, I lost control of my mouth again. And Jesus, you've been so good to me. You forgive me. And I just have this sense that the enemy of our souls has been whispering in a lot of people's ears, saying, you know what? You can still go to church. You can still do your faith thing. But Jesus doesn't love you like he used to. And I'm here to tell you he does. I'm here to tell you that his love for you is bigger than you comprehend. And his grace is so expansive that it covers all your sins. And that this is, needs to be the day that you say, I'm not going to listen to the lies of the enemy. I'm not going to push my Jesus away. I'm going to say, Jesus, I love you. I love you. I love you. You know I love you. And I'm ready to serve you, to follow you, to live for you. And so if that's you, and can I tell you, that's all of us at one moment or another. But if that's you, let this be the day that you look and say, okay, I had my moment last night, last week, this month, whenever it was, and I'll probably have another one down the road, where my life says, Jesus who? I swear I don't know him. May I be cursed if I know Jesus. Where my life, I may not say those words, but my life looks like that. And Jesus comes to you and says, but do you love me? You say, yes. Do you love me? Yes, Jesus. I may be broken, I may mess up, I may not know a lot of things, but I know I love you. Do you love me? Yes. And live for me. Jesus, this is our prayer today. As the risen Lord, the Lord of glory, you left, you conquered the tomb and death and hell and sin. You beat them all. And then you just showed up and talked with real people. And Jesus, when you talked with Peter, you knew what was going on inside of him. You knew that he had so denied you that he needed a special touch of your hand. So Jesus, I pray today for myself and every person listening, because this is for all of us, that when we stumble, Jesus, when we mess up, when the enemy whispers in our ear that you, you can't love us like you used to, you can't forgive us fully, Jesus, may, may we find that restoration. Lord, may we turn from our sin. May we be transformed. May we understand what it means to repent and to change and to follow you with our whole hearts. But Jesus, when we, when we fall, when we sin, when we rebel, your grace is always enough. So this day, Jesus, we say to you, we love you, Jesus. We love you with all our heart. We love you and we want to follow you. And we want to hear your voice saying, then live for me, serve me, be my person in this crazy world. Keep following me. If that's your prayer today, may you walk in that grace and that confidence and that strength that only Jesus can offer you. Jesus, we pray this, thanking you for the goodness of your grace. Amen. Amen. Before I send you off with a word of blessing, I want to encourage you, if you are a volunteer in any ministry of Shoreline, you were invited to a volunteer appreciation lunch today. If you registered for that, we had uh, 250 volunteers at Shoreline register to come to the luncheon. If you registered, please be here. We ordered 290 lunches. So if somebody shows up who didn't register, we still can get, get a lunch to you. But, but if, you're, if you did that, be here at 1230 today in the courtyard, and we're going to have a great uh, lunch together. I'm going to share a word of encouragement with you. We're going to just thank you and bless you for your faithful service. If you need prayer today for anything, 
If you're on campus, come on inside the worship center. We'll pray for you. Or if you're online, just, uh, just uh, call the number you see there or email the church and share your prayer needs. We want to pray with you and for you. And then if you're new at Shoreline, we're so glad you're here with us. And if you're on campus, just go by the Connection Center right here in the lobby, and they want to give you a little gift bag and answer your questions, and thank you for coming. And if you're online and you're new, would you just text the word WELCOME to the phone number you see on the screen, and we will reach out to you and connect with you where you are. Wherever you are today, would you stand with me as I send you off with a word of blessing? As we close this time together, a word of encouragement and a word of blessing. Here's the word of encouragement. The lies of the enemy are just that. They're lies. Don't believe the lie that God's grace is not big enough for you because it is every moment of every day. So walk in his grace. Walk in his strength. When you stumble, let him pick you up. Let Jesus dust you off. Look into his eyes and say, Jesus, I love you, I love you, I love you. I turn from these ways, I pursue you. And if you happen to stumble again, do it again. That's the journey of a follower of Jesus. And his grace will be enough. Let his grace fill you and overflow from you to every person you meet this week. God bless you, have a great week. We'll see you back here again next Sunday.